a green-minded artist, rider on a mission, and a fit and fun activity guaranteed to leave you feeling breathless. It's all local and it's all on this week's Go See the Sky. Welcome to Go See the Sky. I'm your host, Vanessa Ibera, standing in what's likely going to be one of the brightest and busiest spots in the city this spring and summer, the Squamish Community Gardens. Open since 2011, its two locations offer 95 plots for residents to uh, pick up and work on their gardening throughout the season. That being said, get this, all 95 plots have been bought up so far for this year. But don't worry, later on the show we'll tell you where you can go to get an application for next year's plots and also a new one starting in the city. Well, starting off this week's show on Go See the Sky, keeping with the green theme, let's head on up to Whistler, where one artist is proving why one man's trash is another's inspiration. Hey Greg. Hey, how's it going Randy? Yeah, good, you? For Randy Smith, it's a place of inspiration. What are you up to? Oh, just gonna have a look around. Yeah, sounds good. Should be lots of stuff for you to find. All right, thanks. The professional artist, otherwise known as the Doid, browsing the latest shipment of tools and furniture here at the Whistler Rebuild It Center, and what's become a weekly, if not daily, visit for the 35-year-old. While most buy these secondhand items for their purpose, for Smith, it's all about potential. I've got a pretty good imagination. I'll look at things and think whether I can use it or not. Will it hold paint? Am I going to paint on it? Am I going to glue stuff to it? It doesn't work. This discovery and purchase of IKEA shelving an easy find. The also businessman and city worker going as far as scouring surrounding ghost towns, fields, and even neighborhoods in search of his next material. A lot of people, if you happen to see something in their yard that looks like uh, uh, you might be able to use it for artwork, usually people are stoked that you want to take their junk away. All right, there's your receipt. Thanks. There's stuff. Enjoy. Thanks. See you around. Yeah. Smith heading across the street to transform his newest so-called junk. From century-old skulls to duct tape robots, each piece here inside the car detailer's workshop turned studio is as unique as its finds. Selling his repurposed creations in Whistler and Vancouver art shows for the past 15 years. I kind of describe it as sort of uh, lowbrow, mixed medium, I don't really have a name for it. Yeah, weird art. Yeah, I like painting llamas and bunnies and naked green chicks and um, hot rod art. I grew up building hot rods with my dad and uh, so yeah, a lot of influence with that. Showcasing those influential designs on old canvases, wood, glass and even helmets. Smith's most recent creation being used in the first annual repurpose show taking place at the Whistler Rebuild It Center until April 22nd. Organized by assistant manager Greg Cutter, the event showcases close to a dozen local artists' work made completely from reusable materials. Basically to raise awareness, to give um, some sort of outlet for the artists that create this kind of work, a place to show it because there's not a lot of um, places where you, they show this type of work. Open since 2010, the nonprofit organization Center and Depot have quickly become a mecca for sustainably minded artists such as Smith. Both locations packed the brim with items donated by Whistler hotels, businesses, as well as homeowners. With all the shops, as well, part of this year's show's proceeds going towards the Whistler Community Services Society's 26 programs, including the Food Bank and Women's Emergency Shelter, it's about combining social and sustainable responsibility. Just like its cause, each item holds endless possibilities. It's great to see stuff being used for something else, especially something that's useful. I think his work's great and uh, I love uh, the attention that he puts into the details of it. Smith now paying back that very place that's helped sustain his career, donating truckloads of unused materials to the centre over the years. Whether it's through felt, paint or taint, he too is doing his part to build a greener future. I think a lot of artists really understand the concept of using recycled materials. Some go as far as dumpster diving. I haven't really done that yet, but I probably would if I lived in the city though. <laughs> you can make art from anything, anything at all. The 
Whistler Repurpose Show is going on now until April 22nd at the Reuse It Centre. To learn more about the group and how you can donate goods you don't want and help out for a good cause, you can find them on Twitter at Reuse It Whistler. Well, just like world-class athletes, another thing Whistler is known for is world-class skiing, something that's going to be on full display next month at the 23rd Annual Whistler Cup. We spoke to one of this year's competitors, Jack Forsyth. It's a ride that for 14-year-old Jack Forsythe has become his routine as brushing his teeth. The competitive alpine skier heading to the top of Whistler Mountain to take part in his weekly training sessions. Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday I'll go to school and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday I'll do my ski clubs on hill training. Growing up in Whistler, both parents local ski instructors, it's no surprise Forsythe's first steps were practically on skis. His first actual memory stepping foot on this mountain at the age of eight. My dad was going to let me skip school to go skiing with him on my birthday. And I was so excited I couldn't sleep the night before. I loved skiing in the powder so much. Like my heart grew towards the sport, I just fell in love with it. Forsyth joining the Whistler Mountain Ski Club at the age of 11, consistently placing top 10 in slalom, giant slalom and super G races throughout Western Canada. Warming up for his next run, it's here he hopes to nab his next career highlight, competing in the 23rd annual Whistler Cup after placing fifth in last year's GS. I think last year my fifth place at the Whistler Cup would probably be my proudest accomplishment. When I crossed the finish line I was so happy and I was so proud to like, represent my club and represent uh, everyone who supports me in the community. With over 20 countries taking part in April's event, this being Forsyth's fourth year returning, for the Whistler team it doesn't get any better than competing against the world's elite 11 to 14 year olds on home turf. It's incredible. All the other best ski races from around the world are coming to my hometown so that makes it super special. It's great to watch other racers to evolve your own skiing. You can take some of the techniques they're using. Forsyth and his teammates logging countless hours practicing those skills. With cup course speeds reaching up to 120 kilometers per hour, the focus come race day is simple. I'm trying to make it down to the bottom. The biggest part of ski racing is making it down to the bottom. You focused on keeping the skis running cleanly across the snow. A sport just as mental as it is physical. I think the biggest challenge is dealing with your uh, nerves in the start gate. I get my friends to make jokes and my coach, my coaches are quite good at keeping me calm. We've got a little bit more time to execute some accuracy. That distraction paying off, Forsyth also placing first at the 2014 Cypress Zone Race. His next goal, making the provincial or national alpine team, and then the ultimate. I'd like to represent my country at the 2022 Olympics. It's a dream that I've had since I was probably about three years old. That'd be incredible. Awesome to see such drive at such a young age. Good for you, Jack. Here on Chalk TV, of course, along with doing Whistler Cup stories prior to the event, we'll also be providing full coverage of all the festivities that take place the first week of April and doing a special Go See the Sky Whistler Cup edition show in mid-April, so watch for that. Well, don't go anywhere. We still have tons of great stories to bring to you on this week's Go See the Sky, coming to you from Squamish Community Gardens. Coming up, I love being on the road, I like meeting the people, I like traveling by bike, it, it's a pretty amazing way to travel. A cyclist journey turning pain into a new life's purpose. Welcome back from the break. We're here on Go See the Sky, basking in the sunshine at the Squamish Community Gardens, run by the Squamish Climate Action Network, otherwise known as CAN. Now, along with their two locations here at 2nd in Maine, they've announced they're opening up a third one in conjunction with the Rotary Club just north of city centre here. So if you want to get up on their sign-up list for maybe getting a plot for next year or learn more about their programs, you can email cangrowgarden at gmail.com. Well, just like gardening is good for you and the environment, the same can be said when it comes to biking. We learned what one Pemberton rider is doing to help bring awareness to a rare disorder, one pedal at a time. I bought my bike in 1983. It's an Ishiki Continental. 
the frame, the handlebars, they're all original. It's just, it's what I'm comfortable on. A comfort Garthrie's wouldn't trade for the world. The Pemberton triathlete pumping his baby up for his daily ride around town. With no car, it's these two wheels Reese has come to rely and have the best memories on. Logging over 200,000 kilometers cycling through North America, Australia, Europe, and Asia over the years. I love being on the road. I like meeting the people. I like traveling by bike. It, it's a pretty amazing uh, way to travel. An amazement and lifestyle that almost got taken away from him. Garth suddenly waking up paralyzed from the neck down 10 years ago. When I woke up to, to go to work, I, I, I couldn't get out of bed. Uh, my arms and legs didn't really work. So I used my chin to pull myself out of bed. Garth diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome, a disorder where the body's immune system attacks part of the brain and spinal cord's nerves, affecting one in 100,000 people with no early way to diagnose or cure. As the rider spent the next year and a half housebound, slowly regaining back his mobility, his body may have been crippled, but not his spirit. Most of the time, I, I wasn't dwelling on my illness. I was wanting to be better, trying to figure out how to be better. Writing really helped take my mind off of it. It helps you escape where you are. Uh, other people use booze and drugs for that, I guess. I use writing. The lifelong reader writing fiction novels as his health continued to improve, getting back on the bike competing in triathlons a few years later. As he began to put his darker years behind him, it was there his past and future collided. I had started encountering other people with the disease. When telling them what I had done, Australia, New Zealand, and triathlons and everything, I saw a, a change in this person's eyes. It kind of went from hopelessness to hope. And with that, Garth Rides for Hope was born, cycling from Pemberton to South America, raising awareness about Guy Barre syndrome in September 2012. The 62-year-old turning to his now other passion to raise funds along the 2,000 kilometer trek. I thought, well, here's the deal. I'll, I'll raise public awareness in any way I can. And if anybody makes a donation, I'll give them a book. So I'm selling books, but in the name of charity. Garth's message of hope and dedication to finding a diagnosis tool, gaining speed each city he cycled through, sharing his journey speaking at local hospitals, libraries, as well as people's homes on his blog and Facebook page, with some reaching out as far away as Texas. A lady, her husband got in touch with me in email and said, can you talk to my wife? She just got Guillain Barre syndrome. So the internet brings us all closer together. It just takes that one person that's going to give me a connection to a lot of funds or to somebody who will research the idea for the diagnostic tool. Garth continuing to spread that message, cycling from Winnipeg to Texas two years ago. With over $2,000 raised so far and plans to trek through Beijing or Russia later this spring, it's a cause and new life's purpose that can't get any closer to the heart. Basically, that's kind of what I've dedicated my life to now. I, I travel and then I run out of money and then I come back to the Pemberton area, hang out with my sons and grandsons and take whatever jobs I can find to raise enough money to go again. His beloved Ashiki Continental with him every kilometer of the way, each pedal one step closer to a cure. As for when he'll stop? When I can't ride anymore. So that's uh, when, when my body forces me to stop. To get a copy of Garth's ebook as well learn more about his campaign, you can visit him on Facebook at Garth Rides for Hope, as well read all of his blog posts on a title I can't think more fitting for this guy, crazyguyonabike.com. Well, switching gears now to the issue of bullying. Along with physical disabilities, sexual orientation unfortunately can be an easy target for culprits, a reality that one man is trying to change, all thanks to a unique program here in town. Since early elementary, 18-year-old David Thompson knew he was different. Can I just grab a coffee? Sure. I liked different things than the other guys. Like, a lot of them would do, you know, crazy sports, and I'd want to hang out and, like, collect rocks or, you know, pretend I'm a mermaid or something. Like, I just, my, I, I had different interests than the other guys. 
While today the Squamish resident feels safe openly exploring those differences, growing up was a different story. Thompson repeatedly bullied for his sexuality between the age of 8 and 14. As middle school approached, those taunts turned to violent measures. In grade 5, I was actually tied to a pole by some of my peers and was beaten and then left there for two hours. And that was during school time and no one came. It was, it was tough, for sure. It was tough. A dwindling voice with even dire resources, Squamish lacking the services for bullied, depressed, or simply socially isolated LGBTQ members such as David to turn to in the mid to late 2000s. And then there was Margot Dent. I went to a conference in 2011 that said two out of three boys are targeted and teased for being gay, whether they're gay or not. And my concern was the impact that then has on the mental health. Hey. Hey, David, how are you? Good, good. Good to see you. Awesome. What do you think of the space? I love it. I just, Dent, a local yeah. volunteer and mental health worker, pairing up with House Sound Secondary to form Squamish's first diversity club in 2011, a weekly open discussion meeting group for LGBTQ students such as David, along with teens struggling with cultural, racial, and even body issues to gather, with judgment the only thing off the table. I love it. I'm actually really super excited. <laughs> We run the gamut and it can be anything from did you see what was on Facebook last night to did you see that commercial. We definitely cover sex and sexual issues and gender. The need for youth to have a safe space to talk about big issues that are sometimes really huge and parents don't want to talk about. The liberal-minded meetup quickly becoming one of the most popular hangouts at House Sound. Diversity is participants ranging from 20 to 50 teens a session. Every question, every answer, one step closer to the truth. I just thought it was the best thing that could have ever happened to the school. I mean, it was a free support group. It had resources. It answered every question I could have ever asked. Um, it was everything I needed. We'll have to ask them to clear out all this space, but yeah, yeah. it's nice they've at least given us a place to be, hey? Oh, totally. No, it's now graduated three years later, David is paying back that gratitude. Helping Margo turn this room into a similar diversity club for young adults such as himself to continue receiving social support here at the Squamish Youth Resource Centre. The program, a joint collaboration between Quest University and the Safe and Sound Advocacy Group, co-founded by Margo last fall. With Squamish also set to have its first all-day LGBTQ conference come May, it's safe to say the city's colours have never been so bright. Having students like David really helps to, to lead the conversation because we didn't want it to be adult-led. I think last year there was a lot of self-discovery that happened and, and he's been doing a lot of work on himself. That work and healing, all thanks to one woman's voice. I love that woman. I mean, she's really like a mother to me. She really has formed an amazing community that never would have existed without her. David's hope that one day there will be a diversity club in all BC schools, a place to seek solace and stop bullies in their tracks. Kids are coming out at a lot earlier ages now and it's, it's easier. It's just a lot easier to be out in Squamish and it's exciting. Safe and Sound Someone Like Me conference takes place May 9th at the Eagle Eye Theatre at Howe Sound Secondary. To learn more about the group, you can visit them on Facebook at Safe and Sound Squamish. And that being said, reach out to us as well on Facebook and Twitter. You can find us at Go See the Sky. Let us know of any interesting people, places, anything like that we should feature on the show. Well, don't go anywhere. We still have tons of great stories to bring to you on this week's show of Go See the Sky, coming to you from Squamish Community Gardens. After the break. I think you'll be blown away. It's a, it's a great feeling. You're whizzing through the air. You've got the beautiful views out there. We take to the sky with Superfly zip lines.
Welcome back to Go See the Sky. We're here on the show celebrating the start to the gardening season at the Squamish Community Gardens. They offer 95 plots here at their location downtown for residents to buy up and get their green thumb going in spring and summer. And get this, all 95 plots have been scooped up already. So it's great to see. If you want to get the on the sign up list for next year's gardens, you can email camgrowgardens at gmail.com. And while you're here, check out the community board they have at the other location next to me. They offer great workshops both here in the garden and around town for you to take part in. So awesome for all you green thumbs out there. All right, well, throwing to our fifth story of the day here on Go See the Sky. This one was a fun one. Open year round, Superfly Ziplines has quickly become the go-to adventure place for Whistler tourists and locals combined. So what makes it so fun? Well, we threw in a harness to find out. Its lines are the longest in Canada, its speeds topping 100 kilometers an hour. This is Superfly Zip Lines, something I'm about to try today. Hi. Hi. Good morning. How are you? Good, thanks. You here to do the Superfly? I am. I'm here All to right. do the Zip Line. This adventure is starting off an intimidating one, my only zip lining experience in Costa Rica 12 years ago. However, with Superfly Operations three years injury free, I willfully signed my name. Next, it's on to the scale. So if you could just bring your waiver over there, I just need to weigh you. Awesome. Cheering I meet the 60 to 250 pound weight requirement. And with that, our adrenaline adventure begins. As the only year round outdoor operation in Whistler, Superfly Ziplines is well, super busy. Busting around 250 thrill seekers such as myself daily to its base during summer peak season, close to 100 in the winter months. With excitement and nerves continuing to build, I arrive at Cougar Mountain ready to meet my guide. Great, thanks Dan. You're welcome, have a good time. Ah, hey, you must be Vanessa. Yeah. Steve-o. Steve-o, nice How's to meet you. How's it going? Welcome to Superfly Zip Lines. Thank you so much. Cool, so this is the rest of your crew. Uh, you look like you're pretty much ready to, to rock and roll, so we'll just head on over to our harnessing deck and we'll uh, get you ready to go Superfly. Awesome, sounds Perfect. good. Strapping on a custom-designed helmet and heavy-duty harness, this unique experience begins with its equipment. A lot of other zip line companies would use a climbing harness, which can be a little bit uncomfortable, you know, it cuts into you. So yeah, they're, they're just really comfortable. You can sit back and relax and recline in them. So this is our little demonstration line here. So we've got the trolley on the line. Next, we're gonna get you clipped in. Unlike traditional zip lines constructed among tree lines, Superfly systems are embedded in the mountains themselves, allowing riders to soar that much higher and faster. With each line's speeds jumping from zero to 70 kilometers an hour in under 30 seconds, its shock-loaded brake systems make for a smooth but sudden stop. So you do come in with quite a bit of speed. So what we'd like you to do is adopt this position with your legs up and your arms out straight holding the bar. So you're coming in like so. Geared and safety up, it's time to fly. Our first stop, Z1. Reaching a peak of 640 feet off the ground, it's earned the reputation as Canada's highest zip line. I think you'll be blown away. It's a, it's a great feeling. You're whizzing through the air. You've got the beautiful views out there. So it's, it's a pretty incredible experience. Only one way to find out. Ready, ready? All right. Here we go. I love you, Mom. Woo! Soaring between Rainbow and Cougar Mountain, wind ripping through my hair, the ride is as breathtaking as its creek and valley below. Each spin a new beauty to discover. How was your ride? Ah, uh, amazing. It was so smooth. Our initial fear is now behind us. It's on to Z2. Spanning almost 1.3 kilometers, this too has earned the title of longest zipline in Canada. Each second of the mitt and a half soar towards Wedge Mountain, a marvel in itself. You know, you're going for such a long time, you really get to experience the full thing. Sometimes with other things, they go so quickly, you don't actually get to really think about it. You don't get any of that feeling in your stomach when you're on a roller coaster. It's nothing like bungee jumping, you're just, you're kind of there and in the moment. It's a really freeing feeling, it's a way to feel like a bird the beautiful sights, it's amazing. That's the, the really cool thing about out here, we get a lot of people who are coming up from Vancouver and the city and stuff like that, so we're kind of taking them outside of their comfort zone. Enjoy your ride! <laughs> just the amount of acceleration that you get off of it is just phenomenal, it's, it's like nothing else. As we completed our fourth and final zipline of the day back to home base, it was all smiles for this crew. With flyers flocking from all across the world to try out these lines, for Steve-O and his group, it's about helping timid travelers overcome fear, all the while showcasing the best Whistler has to offer. 
How was it? It was amazing. Nice. So great. Nice. Okay, you can let go and step down. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Timo. No problem. Yeah. Nice one. Best to see Whistler, guys. Some fun facts for you. Superfly zip lines is so busy and popular worldwide, the Prince of Dubai has tried out their lines as well. For all you Hollywood starlets, you like this. Charlize Theron and Sean Penn took them out in a few years ago. If you'd like to book your own adventure, you can visit them online, superflyziplines.com. Okay, while the weather in the next story was anything like today's, it wasn't enough to dampen Peter Kent's spirit. With low voter turnout a constant problem come election time here in town, we found out what draft drastic measures the councillor is taking to ignite change. It was a move he promised to make. City Councillor Peter Kent steps toward completing his first election promise. Everybody's asked me if I have nerves. Uh, not really because I'm in really good hand. We've done hundreds of these things. The former Hollywood stuntman, having worked as Arnold Schwarzenegger's body double for 14 years, vowing to light himself on fire if Squamish's voter turnout increased in last fall's municipal election after a dismal 38% in 2011. I think there was a lot of voter apathy. I think that it mainly comes from uh, the younger voters who just feel disenfranchised. They feel like, well, what's the point? What am I, I, no one's gonna hear my voice. Kent's idea to change those viewpoints spreading like wildfire, with votes jumping to 47%. Holding true to his word, around 200 locals and media braved the pouring rain at the Logger Sports Ground to witness the spectacle. It's really cool. Like, you know, when do you ever get to see someone light themselves on fire? He's a professional, so I have faith in him and his team. Uh, I'm excited to see it, and I'm also excited that voter turnout was up this year. Whether that excitement will trickle over to City Hall remains a question. With a 22% voter increase in last fall's municipal election, it appears voter interest is heating up here in Squamish. Or is it? With a 60% of the population here in Squamish under the age of 40, we took to the streets to find out if our younger population really cares what goes on at City Hall. I'm not very interested in politics at all. No reason in particular. Nothing seems to change. I don't want to do it too much. I just kind of do my own thing around town with school. I really care what happens at City Hall. And the one thing that I found out this year was that you can make a difference. And with voter turnout, we actually managed to get a new mayor in Squamish. We have largely a new council. So we're actually seeing the results of voting happening. I care a lot about what goes on at City Hall because Squamish is a pretty small town. And so you do get to see like a lot of the effects. Yeah. While an improvement, it's that still split mindset Kent is going to great lengths to further change. So what we have on now is the first layer of underwear infused with the stunt gel. His team carefully dressing him in three layers to protect his body from the flames. With Squamish recently ranked number 32 of top 52 places to visit by the New York Times, Kent is also looking to reach out to Quest University and high school students for online strategies to get the city further on the map. Like any change, it begins with attitude. We're at a very pivotal turning point right now in this town's history. The youth are the people who are going to take it over eventually, and they're going to have to deal with the mistakes of the past. Get out there and make, it, make a difference, and you really can't. Don't try this at home. And with that, it's time for the big show. <laughs> Blazing a trail for future generations with a little smoke along the way. Peter Kent was in 14 of Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies and in 2009 he was the first Canadian to be inducted into the Hollywood Stuntsman's Hall of Fame. To learn more about our Squamish City Councillor, you can visit him on his website, peterhkent.com. All right, well that's it for this week's show coming to you from the Squamish Community Gardens. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, if you want to get on the sign up list for next year's plots around town, be sure to email them at cangrowgarden at gmail.com. You can also find more information on the plots on the city website. Just go underneath the recreation tab. From all of us here at Go See the Sky, we'll see you next time.